A heat wave in California continues. Precipitation in the southeastern U.S. diminishes a little bit. And off Baja, California, we've got Hurricane K, a high-end Category 2 storm. Looking at that surface chart, quasi-stationary front from the Carolinas, over to about Mobile, Baton Rouge, and arcing back up through Dallas and Kansas. Now, there are some surface analyses that have a cold front through the Texas Hill Country, but look at those temperatures back there, 90s, and the thickness values actually increase as you go north, and that is not consistent with a cold front. So this is all continental tropical air and the cooler air found in eastern Oklahoma and Arkansas. Another hot day for California. At the time we put this analysis together, 11 a.m. Pacific, it was 100 at Sacramento. There's the latest chart at 2 p.m. around the Sacramento area. Mid-100s, the hottest that I'm seeing is Sacramento International Airport 106. This looks a tiny bit cooler than what we had yesterday, but still, this is some brutal heat. 101 out there, just east of the Bay Area, 83 at San Francisco International Airport, and 109 at Stockton, 111 at Merced. What else is there? Yeah, that's, that's going to be the big ones, and going up the valley. It does look a little bit cooler than yesterday. Let's take a look what happened yesterday. And there you go. There's the damage yesterday, the maximum temperatures. And this was probably the hottest day of this heat wave. 116 at Sacramento. That broke the all-time record. 116, I believe, was also recorded downtown. It was either 115 or 116. And all the way down the valley, 110s, very common. I see 115 around Bakersfield. I think that's just south of there. And what else do we have? 117. And that was located at Merced. Let's take a look at the plots for the hottest hour of the day. We are looking at yesterday's numbers. And there's the plots around Sacramento showing that 116 there at Sacramento International Airport. Also, some very hot numbers coming in around 115 at Travis Air Force Base and 112 down around Livermore. 85 at San Francisco International Airport and, let's see, 105 at San Jose. And here's a sneak peek at the high temperatures for today. Looks like they're only forecasting 108 at Sacramento. We'll see about that. 110 at Fresno, but numerous Records for the date, this is more than I've seen in a long time, all the way up to Montana, over to Colorado, 101 at Grand Junction, 94 at Cheyenne, and these dark reds, those are breaking the record for the date by a significant amount, 9 degrees above the previous record at Glasgow, Montana, 105, the previous record, 96, so that's pretty significant. Same thing at Sheridan, major heat up in that part of the country, and even down around San Diego, 103 at Ramona, and 106 at Burbank. And I suspect with the increase in easterly flow, there could be a little bit more downslope coming off the coastal range. I don't know if that's the case at this moment, but we should see that large-scale easterly flow starting to set in at some point, and that'll tend to keep the marine layer from going very far inland. And there it is, Hurricane K, high-end Category 2 storm, 105 mile-an-hour sustained winds. And the track will be running about like this. No direct impact on Los Angeles and San Diego, but it will affect quite a bit of moisture northward. And there it is on the precipitable water, one-inch precipitable water amounts like that, one and a half and two inches, and then two and a half there. So you can see over the next couple of days... Yeah, that's kind of like a wall of moisture that heads north into the valleys, the Mojave Desert, into the San Diego and Los Angeles area. The GFS taking that track pretty close to the coast, but it does remain offshore. The higher winds should stay pretty close to that center. So we're not looking at any major impacts unless this storm curves more to the north. And you can see NHC here, they're looking for recurvature to the left 
and away from the coastal regions. Continuing our survey of weather across the continent, we head up north, there's a Pacific system. This is of not much help for California and Nevada. I would say that front is almost stationary, but up to the north, there's the transition zone, and we get right into the cold air in British Columbia. Temperatures drop to the 50s in that area, and there is some cold air advection, showers, and rain. Alaska is still looking very mild for this time of year. In fact, we're seeing the 540 decameter contour. That's indicating some much colder air. 540, that tends to be the snow versus rain discrimination line. When that comes into the U.S. itself, we start looking for the precept to change over to frozen and freezing forms. Not really doing that in Alaska, the air mass still has a little bit of warmth to it, but it does show you how much cooler the air is. Lots of 30s and 40s in that part of the continent. In Nunavut, in the southern part of the region, very strong wound up system. This is probably the strongest extratropical low I've seen in about three or four months. 980 millibars, possibly a little bit lower out there along the western Hudson Bay coast. But you can see just down to the south, this cold air coming in the backside is actually rather mild, 50s, 60s, and even 70s along the west coast of Hudson Bay. Most of the cold air that's confined up in this area, and it's just basically wrapping into the center of that circulation as that low ends up heading north into the graveyard of these barotropic systems. That tends to be up there around Baffin Island. So that's going to be it for that storm. It's going to gradually diminish and be out of the picture, leaving mild air across central and eastern Canada. And we come south into the east coast region, onshore flow, north of this low, south of this high. That air mass bringing some rain to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland. And back in here, you just see the northerly flow coming in from the Midwest. A mild day, temperatures in the upper 70s. And the dew points slightly lower, but still looking at 60s in that part of the country. And I did want to go back to the system in Alberta. It does have strong baroclinic support. You can see that packing of the thickness contours on each side of that low. That's it right there. We've got an occlusion up to the north in the main baroclinic zone right there. And... Let's take a look at the GFS. So this is the GFS for this evening. Strong cold front coming south through Alberta. Warm front about like that. So this is now up in Saskatchewan. Lots of warm air down here. And let's go forward another 24 hours to tomorrow evening. Now that low pressure area is right there. Cold front dropping south. Warm front into James Bay. And this is starting to get bound up with that other occlusion up to the north, sort of a Fujiwara effect between these two lows. So we go forward another 24 hours. You can see that low right here. It's already occluded. The main bear clinic zone is maybe up here in Quebec. So now we have the two occlusions on Friday morning. And they just kind of revolve around each other and merge, and then it finally diminishes. And you can see how cut off this system is from the warmer air down to the south. So there's a lot to see on these pressure and temperature charts. And you may have seen this diagram before. This is the life cycle of a frontal wave, and it starts out there with a boundary between two different air masses, the blue lines, I don't know if you can see the blue dashed lines, that's indicating cold air to the north and warm air to the south. The packing of those dashed lines indicates the frontal gradient. So it's concentrated right there north of this boundary. And eventually we develop a unstable wave. You can see it advecting cold air south, warm air to the north, and before long, it resembles a typical frontal system. That's a mature stage right there. And eventually, the cold air wraps fully around that low and detaches it from the warm air. You can see the warm air in the last stage right there. 
and as you might guess, new area of possible bear clinic development right there where I have that blue mark. The old low heading off into the cooler air where it wants to be, I guess. And of course, that's that low we were talking about in Nunavut, the Fujiwara effect between the new mature low and the old occlusion. And eventually the whole thing becomes a big occlusion just spinning up there in the Arctic region. And back to those temperatures. This is, of course, today, Wednesday. Let's check out tomorrow. Heat wave continues, but it looks like it's detached into two main areas. One in Colorado and Nebraska, 100 at Denver, breaking the old record by 6 degrees. And the heat continues in California, Sacramento back up to 113, breaking the old record by 8 degrees. Reno, on the other side of the Sierra Nevada, also getting 100 degrees, which is kind of rare for this time of year. And for Friday, the heat settles back in on California, all the way from San Diego up to Eugene, Oregon. Sacramento 108, 98 at Camarillo, and 107 at Fresno. And for Saturday, Hurricane K makes its way up towards Southern California, going over that cold current, so it's going to be weakening. However, extensive cloud shield, significant moisture that will change the air mass quite a bit. And you can see we get rid of the heat wave. However, looks like some of that migrates up north. 103 at Medford, 98 at Eugene, and 90 at Quileute. On Sunday, looking for some moderation of the crazy weather, still 85 approaching a record up there in central Idaho. Also Miami coming up to 92. Next week, continuing to look more civilized than what we have this week. 92 up there at uh, Marathon, Florida, and that's pretty much it. And likewise, no significant impacts for Tuesday either. But let's take a look at the European Extreme Forecast Index. So here you go. Here's the Extreme Forecast Index. Anywhere you see a color, that means one of the parameters is anonymously high or low. So across the western U.S. for tomorrow, no surprise about that heat. The orange showing the extent of the worst conditions. The purple indicating the strong winds. So there's the strong northerly winds back behind this maritime polar system off of Washington and Oregon. And we haven't talked about this, but there's Earl out there in the Atlantic. No big impacts for that, so I have not really discussed it yet. The track is going to be running about like that. And, of course, K. The greens indicating precip off the Baja California coast. And looks like the easterly flow starting to set in, downslope flow, scouring out some of the marine layer and bumping up the temperatures offshore. So if you're off the coast right there in a ship, kind of an unusually warm day, but probably just by several degrees. Let's take a look at the forecast for Friday. The European model showing the remains of K off the South California coast right there. It seems to be trending more towards the NHC solution. You can see the heavier precip on the mountains of northern Baja California into the mountainous areas of San Diego. The heat continuing up to the north, but that's going to be the final day of that heat wave. So by Saturday, we're looking like this. Some of that heat works its way up the coastal range into Oregon and Washington and mostly rain for the L.A. area and San Diego. For Sunday, not much going on. Slightly cooler around Colorado, slightly cooler in Baja, California, and really not much in the way of heat problems in the western U.S. And there's Monday and Tuesday. So we're trending more towards seasonal climatology for September. A quick look at regional weather. Thunderstorms along a linear axis from the Carolinas to Jackson, Lufkin, Houston, and San Antonio. You can see back behind this area of thunderstorms, northerly flow. So that's more cool air coming down with this Hudson Bay pattern, reinforcing that boundary and pushing it south. 
in Texas, some high cirrus spreading up from Mexico. That's associated with that series of tropical cyclones west of Mexico. And of course, that boundary, the tail end, moving into the Interstate 10 corridor of Texas, back behind it, northeasterly flow. The southwest sector showing the monsoon pretty much shut down, except in the Great Basin area. Some storms going up in the higher elevations of Nevada and Utah. Down to the south, of course, we mentioned K working its way north should be in the Los Angeles area in a couple of days. But, of course, the bulk of it will be well offshore. A close look at Los Angeles does show some wildfires have gotten started. That's going to be south of Riverside. I'm not sure exactly what mountain that would be, but that's the plume spreading towards the west. So, yeah, we do have some offshore flow at this time. I can see another fire along the U.S.-Mexican border right there, spreading smoke over southern San Diego. In the northwestern U.S., we get caught up with that other frontal system right up in that region. Some smoke working its way around the ridge from Idaho, Montana, and all the way down into Nebraska. That's a pretty stout plume of smoke. Uh, I guess it would be north of North Platte and south of Rapid City. Well, Rapid City does have smoke, but the bulkier part of it, yeah, that's out around Pine Ridge over to north central Nebraska. And on the northern plain sector, we get a better look at that. Other than that, northerly flow in the Midwest region. And there in the northeastern U.S., we have that onshore flow. A rather cloudy day, rainy and dreary, from New York City to Erie and south into the Washington, D.C. area. And that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. I want to thank our newest supporter, Scott Shepard. Thank you very much for your support. I do appreciate it. I'll leave you once again with some more footage of Western San Antonio. Thanks very much to Greg for this great footage. This great footage just keeps on coming. Always great stuff to see out there near the Texas Hill Country. We'll see you back here on Friday. Hope you have a great Wednesday evening. Take care and we'll see you in a couple days. Bye-bye.